Hello, my friends. Hello, and welcome once again to the Rustic Von Lodge. The kitchen of the Rustic Von Lodge. And it's the Robert E. Howard Show. It's the Robert E. Howard Show once again. And if you've been following my past exciting episodes of the Robert E. Howard Show, then you know that we are in the midst of Sumerian September. Sumerian September, a fantastic reading event where we are reading every single Conan story written by Robert E. Howard. None of that pastiche stuff, although I might get to that later on. No, these are all the original stories by Robert E. Howard, and I'm reading them in the three-volume set from Del Rey, which began its life as a set of books published by Wandering Star, but Del Rey took over the set, and so this is the first volume, The Coming of Conan the Sumerian, and this is the book I'm talking about today, the first volume in the three-volume Del Rey set, with fantastic illustrations. There are great illustrations in this by Mark Schultz, and he just does a wonderful job, Mark Schultz does. I really enjoy his illustrations in this volume. So it had, it's been a while since I've read Conan. It's been a few years. It was well before the pandemic happened, so it's probably longer than I think since I've read the Conan stories. And I am really enjoying them. And I really enjoyed this book. This is the beginning of the Conan saga. And there are some interesting things about it. So most of us, I think, when we think about Conan, just, you know, if you're just the average person and you're thinking about Conan, you're probably thinking about Conan either from the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie or from the comic books, or some other source other than the original stories. But they were fantastic stories that were written in the 1930s by Robert E. Howard, the creator of Conan. And the interesting about, thing about that is that Conan has become one of those literary creations that, have, that has just moved on from its, from its creator. Much like Tarzan and Sherlock Holmes and Superman. He's, Conan is one of those characters that even somebody who's never even heard of Robert E. Howard probably has heard of Conan and probably can tell you a bit about, well, their idea of who Conan is anyway. Everybody knows that Conan's a barbarian. Not everybody knows that he's a Sumerian. But definitely... He, Conan is one of those characters who has moved on, and he's been in all sorts of media. He's been in video games, films, like I said, comic books, a lot of pastiche fiction. I mean, just countless novels have been written about the character Conan. For a long time, Robert E. Howard's original Conan stories were out of print, and yet there were still Conan pastiche novels being published usually with no mention of Robert E. Howard at all, which was pretty annoying at the time, I'll tell you. We're living in a good time now, though, because all of Robert E. Howard's stories are available. They are all in print exactly as he wrote them, with no pastiche fiction or other sort of nonsense mixed in, which is important. Robert E. Howard wrote all of these when he was a young man. He never lived to become an older man. He died when he was 30 years old by suicide, unfortunately. So all of these Conan stories were written by a guy in his 20s. And what remarkable stories they are. And it's interesting to think about. These stories were all published, or most of these stories were published, in Weird Tales magazine during Robert E. Howard's lifetime. A fantastic pulp magazine that also published... H.P. Lovecraft and Clark Ashton Smith and so many other great writers. But Conan was a character, the main character of this series that Robert E. Howard was writing, and Conan's only home was in the pulp magazines. The films, uh, the comic books, the pastiche novels, all of that self, all of the media that has grown up, 
out of out of these stories, Robert E. Howard was completely unaware of any of that. That was all in the future. As far as Robert E. Howard knew, Conan would be forgotten, like a lot of pulp stories are. He wasn't like Conan, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, for example, who lived to see his character become a sensation. And the same can be said for Edgar Rice Burroughs with Tarzan. Edgar Rice Burroughs lived long enough to see Tarzan become a, a huge phenomenon and grow outside of the original novels into movies and comic books and everything else. Edgar Rice Burroughs saw that happen. Robert E. Howard never did. Robert E. Howard had no, had no idea about what was going to happen with his character. He never knew. And when I went into this book this time, reading the Conan stories this time, I tried to put myself in a mindset where I forgot, where I tried to put out of my mind everything else that I've seen or heard or read about Conan. And I've mentioned before, usually when I read or have read Conan in the past, the picture of Conan in my mind has always been the the version of Conan that was drawn by John Buscema in Marvel Comics. For me, John Buscema's Conan has always been Conan. The first time I ever saw the character was in a comic book drawn by John Buscema. But this time, going in, I tried to put that out of my mind. I deliberately tried to put that out of my mind. I deliberately tried to go into these stories as if all of that didn't exist as if only the stories existed, as they ex existed for Robert E. Howard. And so Conan's world and the, the, uh, the, the, the age, the Hyborian age in which Conan lived, I tried to picture that all as a new thing, and I tried to picture it in a new way. It was an interesting thought experiment, and it worked, you know. It allowed me to view these stories unencumbered with all of the baggage that usually Conan drags around with him nowadays after being in all of those films and things. And so I could just experience the stories as they were. And this edition presents the Conan stories in the order that they were written. They have been presented in different ways over time. But I think probably the best way to experience them is in the order that Robert E. Howard wrote them, which begins with Conan not as a wandering adventurer, but as a king. The first story in this volume, if I can get to it, it's, they, there's a poem called Samaria, which is, which opens up this volume, and then we get to the Phoenix on the Sword, now, in this volume, all of the chapter headings have these wonderful illustrations, and they are just great. Phoenix on the Sword, starting when Conan is a middle-aged man, he's already king of Aquilonia, the greatest nation in the Hyborian Age. That is an interesting place to start. Because basically, you're starting towards the end of his career. The last decade of his life that we know anything about is, you know, when he was king starting with the phoenix on the sword. And it starts with this beautiful passage, and I'm sure if you've seen other videos by other booktubers talking about Sumerian September, they've read this passage, because everybody reads it, so I'll read it myself. This, is, this starts off with this from the Nemedian Chronicles. Know, O prince, that between the years when the oceans drank Atlantis and the gleaming cities, and the years of the rise of the sons of Arius, there was an age undreamed of, when shining kingdoms lay spread across the world like blue mantles beneath the stars. Nemedia, Ophir, Brythunia, Hyperborea, Zemera, with its dark-haired women and towers of spider-haunted mystery, Zingara, with its chivalry, Koth, that bordered on the pastoral lands of Shem, Stygia, 
with its shadow-guarded tombs, Hyrcania, whose riders wore steel and silk and gold. But the proudest kingdom of the world was Aquilonia, reigning supreme in the dreaming west. Hither came Conan, the Sumerian, black-haired, sullen-eyed, sword in hand, a thief, a reaver, a slayer, with gigantic melancholies and gigantic mirth, to tread the jeweled thrones of the earth under his sandaled feet. So, you need to start off with a story in the first place just to get that. That is the beginning of the Conan saga. You need that at the start of reading Conan. And then we get into this story where Conan is king. He has... He was a mercenary general of Aquilonia before he took the throne. And he literally killed the king and took the throne off of the king's gory head. And he made himself king. And he was considered a liber liberator at the time of Aqu Aquilonia because the previous king, he really sucked. And Conan was awesome, but he is an outlander. He is a foreigner. And so some people didn't like that so much, and they took advantage of that fact to try to topple Conan from the throne for their own nefarious purposes. And you get a bit of that in this story. An interesting thing about this story, though, is that the first sign we get of Conan, he isn't, you know, in the middle of a battle swinging his sword around, chopping people to bits, although you get that really quickly in this story. I mean, it gets right to that. But that's not the first that we see of Conan. The first that we see of Conan, as depicted in this illustration, is that he's at a desk and he's drawing a map of the northern kingdoms that most Hyborians, Aquilonians, they don't know anything about. And so the first time we see Conan is that scene at a desk as a middle-aged man, which is interesting because that's not what you would expect if you're only familiar with Conan from other sources. Now, sure enough, he gets into a fight later on in the story. And we get, we get lots of blood and guts because that is an important part of Conan. That is true. Conan is a barbarian, even when he becomes king. Always in his heart, he is a barbarian. He has learned over time to become a good king. And... His subjects are very important to him, and the responsibility of being a king, I mean, that's changed him. And you do see this character change over time whenever he starts gaining any responsibility over other people, whether he's a general or whatever, or even the leader of an outlaw band. He takes those responsibilities seriously. So every story in here, every story in the Conan saga going forward, and it jumps around in time a lot, every story going forward, you know where Conan's going to end up. He's going to end up as king of the greatest nation in the world. And that's interesting. That adds something to every story that he's in. Because Robert E. Howard, when he was writing these, was jumping all over the place in Conan's adventures. And that was deliberate. As he said in a letter, he, feels, he felt like the average adventurer, if you were just sitting around talking to a guy who's had lots of adventures, he's not going to tell you his story in chronological order. He's just going to jump around to different stories as they occur to him. And that's kind of how this is. Because this starts off with the phoenix on the sword... And then we get the Frost Giant's Daughter, which is a story that took place when he was very young. Conan was a young man. The only survivor of a battle. This happens to Conan quite frequently, where he's the only survivor of a battle. Because he's so tough, you can kill everybody else, but killing Conan, that's another, that's another matter entirely. And so we get to the Frost Giant's Daughter, which was originally rejected by Farnsworth Wright, the editor of Weird Tales. He felt that Conan was a little shady in this story, The Frost Giant's Daughter, where he meets a young woman at the edge of a battlefield who lures him 
and she wants to lure him away from the battlefield in order to have her brothers kill him and so they can all hang out at the dinner table eating his heart as they did so she was kind of creepy but she was beautiful and magnificent and Ch Conan chased her across the snows and Farnsworth Wright was concerned about what was going to happen if Conan caught her and didn't feel that this put Conan in the best light perhaps so this was never published as a Conan story during Robert E. Howard's lifetime. It's a dynamite story, though. As, and, and just look at that. That's magnificent. Really good story. And then we get to The God and the Bowl, another story that was never published during Robert E. Howard's lifetime, but is a really excellent story, which takes place when Conan was a thief. And Conan is hired to steal something from this ancient museum and runs into trouble and runs into a monster, which he has to take care of. It's a great story. I mean, it's not the best Robert E. Howard story, but I appreciated it a lot more upon this reading. I really enjoyed it as this kind of ancient detective story, almost. And it's great to see young Conan the Thief in this role. And then we get to the Tower of the Elephant, which is probably, it could be the best story in this volume. It could be. The Phoenix on the Sword is awful good. So is the Scarlet Citadel. But the Tower of the Elephant just works so well as a short story. It could be one of the best short stories I've ever read. It's just great as a piece of sword and sorcery. It's great, it's great as a Conan story. Conan, as a, again, as a young thief, tries to steal the heart of the elephant and gets into all kinds of supernatural shenanigans and fights a giant spider, you know, so it's awesome. Again, we're getting Conan as a very young man. Another amazing story. But then, after that, we fast forward in time again to the Scarlet Citadel. The Scarlet Citadel, which takes place once again when Conan is king of Aquilonia. So you see, we're jumping all over in time. The Scarlet Citadel is a magnificent story. I love it. I think it's just great. Wonderful sword and sorcery story where Conan's army is defeated through treachery. Conan is captured, put in, some, put in the pits below the Scarlet Citadel, has to make his way past a giant snake. He has to deal with wizards, all kinds of cool stuff. It's excellent really, really good story, The Scarlet Citadel. And I really think it stands out as one of the best stories in the Conan saga. Not every story can be said, not everybody can, story can be said to be really good in this volume. Um, this has some of the best Conan stories. It has, has a couple Conan stories that aren't the best. This one is one of the best, though. Queen of the Black Coast, where Conan meets a pirate queen, Belit, who's really pretty ruthless. I guess as you would expect a pirate queen to be. But she's really ruthless. She sure loves Conan, though. She takes one look, of, look at Conan and tears her clothes off and says, you know, you're the one, man. And he says, oh, okay. It's an excellent story. One of the best Conan stories, I think. Great atmosphere, great plot, interesting relationship. Conan, as you'll see if you read these stories, is a great one for meeting women and losing them along the way. If, if he's with a woman in a story, he probably is not with the same woman in the next story. In fact, I can guarantee it. Belit, though, was different. He stayed with her, according to this story, for a long time. Why did they not stay together well, the story tells you. And then we move on to Black Colossus. Black Colossus, which takes place when Conan is a mercenary captain. But in this story, he's, he is given the responsibility of a general. And this is an important moment in Conan's career and in his life where he's given this responsibility. There he is all 
dressed up all fancy pants because he took on this responsibility. Another fantastic illustration. Excellent story, Black Colossus. Again, we have a, a dark and horrible wizard. Conan has to take him out. Great story. So, the stories have been pretty great up to this point. Then we get to Iron Shadows in the Moon. Iron Shadows in the Moon. Which is not the best Conan story, but it's good. It's good. It's a good Conan story. He went through a period right about at this point where he wrote several kind of potboiler stories written in quick succession, which he needed to do because he needed to get these into the magazines because this was his living, Robert E. Howard. He, he was a pulp writer, and pulp writers tended to have to write fast. And so usually when he wrote a Robert when he wrote a Conan story, he only did like two drafts, usually. And so this is a good story, not the best story, but I really enjoyed it. Again, magnificent illustrations for this. Then we get to Zuthal of the Dusk, which is one of those stories that a lot of people don't like. But I happen to like it quite a bit, where Conan and his lady friend, whose name I'm not remembering because he had so many of them. They are, they're, again, the last members of an army. They're deserters, basically, of this army that was falling apart. And they're out in the desert, and they come across this city right at the point where they're about to keel over from dehydration. And in this city, we encounter strange people, and a terrifying Lovecraftian monster. Just this really gross, really strange Lovecraftian monster. It is a bit of a pot boiler. There are stuff, there's stuff that Robert E. Howard put in here just to, because he knew Farnsworth Wright would like it, you know. And indeed he did. It was, it was published, and it's, it's, an, it's a fun Conan story, I think. You have, you know, a little flagellation in this story, which was always popular with Farnsworth Wright, and sometimes got a Margaret Brundridge, Brundridge cover illustration for Weird Tales, you know. So, yeah, that was in there. Then we have the Pool of the Black One. The Pool of the Black One, another cool, quick little story with some really dark magic. There's some really dark magic in this and some... The, the monsters in this one were pretty creepy. And this actually is the cover illustration is from this particular story. That was a good one. Then we get to one I like a lot, Rogues in the House. Rogues in the House. Which is another story when Conan was a thief. He's fairly young. There's Conan being Conan. And this one's interesting because it shows Conan being pretty unscrupulous. I mean, he's in a jail and he's hired by this young nobleman. And the nobleman's like, I'll get you out of, I'll get you out of jail. You just have to kill someone for me. And Conan's like, who? Who do you want me to kill? And, you know, he takes, he takes the job. Conan does what he has to do. And they have a cool little adventure. Probably my least favorite story, and it could be everybody's least favorite story for Conan, is The Veil of Lost Women. I'm going to guess that this story is the story that people like the least most often. Not every time, I'm sure, but it's not, it doesn't particularly work. There's some period racism in it that seems more overt than it really should have been even at the time. Robert E. Howard was not as bad at that, at that kind of thing as a lot of writers were in the pulps, but still, you see it here, which is unfortunate. The ending of the story almost makes up for it because the latter parts of the story are actually pretty good if you just take them on their own, but it's still not a particularly great story. Unlike... The Devil in Iron, which is the story that comes next, 
Veil of Lost Women, though, did have this great illustration in it. But The Devil in Iron comes next, which was a rock-solid Conan story. Again, not the best Conan story, but I think it was better than the three or four that preceded it. It's, or at least the three that preceded it. Conan fights a giant snake. There were a lot of giant snakes in the Hyborian Age. Not as many giant snakes as there were giant apes. Conan had a lot of trouble in the Hyborian Age with giant apes. But The Devil in Iron was awesome, and that closes out this volume, actually. We do get the first submitted draft of the Phoenix on the Sword, which is interesting. Farnsworth Wright didn't accept the Phoenix on the Sword right away. He wanted some changes made. And Robert E. Howard made those changes. And it really helps the story, actually. It's a much better story. The story that was submitted is much better, I think, than the original draft that's included in this volume. Phoenix on the Sword, of course, was originally based on a King Cole story that was never published. And since it was never published, Robert E. Howard figured nobody's ever going to see this thing. So it's okay for me to turn this into a Conan story, which he did in the Conan version, I think is much better. So altogether, this was a fantastic reading experience. What a great way to start off this series. I mean, he just... He, he just starts off running in this one. And what a great series of stories. Highly, highly recommend it. Of course, if you're not taking part in Sumerian September, of course you can read these anytime. But I do recommend this set. I do re recommend this volume. I'm on this volume right now, which I'll talk all about in the future. This one actually has Robert E. Howard's only novel-length story, The Hour of the Dragon. So I'll talk about that's those once I'm done reading them, which should be in a couple of days at, at the latest. And I will catch you next time.